Okay, welcome back. This is part three of chapter two for Of Mice and Men. We just had um, the exit of Curly's wife. She was looking for Curly, stops by and checks out the new guys. Slim, the leader of the group um, of workers, kind of calls her on it as he's walking by, as the team has come back from the fields on his way to the wash basin, the wash rooms. You know, and he says to her, oh, well, you're not trying very hard, trying to look for Curly. So she becomes apprehensive and suddenly leaves. Now, again, I told you, please be mindful of perspective in regards to Curly's wife, that she is the only female on this ranch and that the men are not going to be sympathetic to her. So just be aware of that, you know, that, that they are already biased against her. So just be mindful, okay? Now, <clears throat> excuse me, so here we go. George's opinion of her, Jesus, what a tramp. So that's what Curly picks for a wife. Now, Lenny says defensively, she's pretty, she's pretty. Um, yeah, and she sure is hiding it. And she's certainly coming around and having, uh, you know, trying to make friends with the guys, whether she's flirting or whether it's just friendly and not sexual. It's up for debate, okay? But um, Lenny, though, definitely has his eye on Curly's wife, you know, and he's still staring at the doorway where she had been. And he says again, she's pretty. And he smiles admiringly. And George looks quickly at him and then takes him by the ear and shooks him, shakes him, you know, and says, you know, tell him to listen to him. Don't even look at her. I seen him poison before, but I ain't never seen no piece of jail bait worse than her. You leave her be. Now, we know that Lenny has gotten in trouble before. Why do you think George mentioned that in Chapter 1? Because Steinbeck, again, is setting us up. We know Lenny has had trouble with girls before. He grabbed the girl's dress in the town of weed. Now, again, you can defend him, and you can say, but he didn't mean to touch, you know, to hurt the girl. He just wanted to touch her dress because he likes to pet soft things. Okay, fine, but... I mean, imagine if some big lug you're walking by grabbed your dress. What would you do? And how would you take it? Oh, he just wanted to pet the soft things. Really? Well, really? Because now look at his reaction to Curly's wife. Um, he ain't looking at her dress and wanting to touch the red dress. He's noticing that she is pretty. So just be mindful of that. Again, you know, we know Lenny lies and tries to cover himself, just like he did with the mouse. I found her dead. No, George, I just wanted to touch her red dress. I didn't want to hurt her. Okay, well, all right. I don't think he necessarily wants to hurt her, but uh, he certainly is um, interested, shall I say, in her and her appearance. So, and I don't know if Lenny understands everything about, um, let's say, the birds and the bees and leave it at that. <laughs> But it's definitely, we know that he has gotten in trouble before. Okay, do you see a pattern? Gotten in trouble with the mouse. Um, not going to tend the rabbits. Don't say a word. He said a word. Uh, we have the foreshadowing of the fight with Curly. That's go There's going to be a fight with Curly. You know it because Steinbeck doesn't stop talking about it. His characters don't stop talking about it. And now we get some more conflict here with our rising action with Curly's wife. And we know Lenny is not going to be able to stay away from her. We know it. And she's not going to be able to stay away from them. Okay, so George yells at uh, Lenny some more. And my page doesn't want to turn. There we go. Nope, too far. Okay. All right, so we get this sudden cry from Lenny. I don't like this place, George. This isn't a good place. I want out of here. And again, foreshadowing. But Lenny, but George is like, no, we got to stay until we get a steak. And he's not talking about a ribeye or a porterhouse. He's talking about money. So a motivating factor for George? Money. Hmm. Nope. Sorry, Lenny. We got to stay put here. We're going to figure this out and we got to, you know, we got to save some money. And he's like, nope, I don't like it either. But they just have to get a few more dollars and then they can, oh, a few more dollars and shove off and go up the American River and pan gold. I don't know if you guys watched the um, 
Alaskan gold miners, Gold Rush show on the was it History Channel or Discovery. But George always seems to be on the move, huh? Can't seem to keep a job. I wonder why that is, why George is not satisfied and always wants to keep wandering around and have these schemes of like, almost like get rich kind of quick schemes. Like, oh, we'll save a few dollars and then, I'll, then we'll go pan gold and then we'll get rich quick. Okay. Hmm. Interesting. All right. So now the guys are going to come in from the wash basin. It's going to get, you know, they're coming in, going to be getting ready to go eat. Okay. And now we meet Slim. Now notice how much, oh, look at all the words that Steinbeck uses to describe Slim. And the description of Slim is so verbose. There's so much here and more than just the usual, like this is what the character is wearing. I mean, look at this. It's almost um, mythic. You know, he moved with a majesty only achieved by royalty and master craftsmen. Ooh, Slim's a real great guy. He's the prince of the ranch, capable of driving 10, 16, even 20 mules. You know, there's a bit of myth here with him. He's a master craftsman. Prince of the ranch. Um, there's a gravity in his manner and a quiet so profound that all talk stopped when he spoke. Oh, much like a king. His authority was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. And now notice, one of the few times we get the only, one of the very few, if not the only time that Steinbeck actually tells us a character's name. This was Slim, the jerkline skinner. Hmm. His hatchet face was ageless, maybe 35 or 50 years old. He could hear more than was said to him. His so slow speech had overtones not of thought, but of understanding beyond thought. Whoa, this guy seems pretty crazy. You know, almost too perfect. Okay, so he comes in, makes conversation with the guys, sits down next to George, takes a look at the solitaire hand that George um, was playing. You can tell a lot by a guy the way he plays cards. See how smart he is or not. He seems very nice. Hope you guys get on my team. His voice was very gentle. Huh. And he's like, I got a pair of punks on my, my team and don't know a barley bag from a blue ball. You guys ever buck barley? And then now George, you know, he doesn't talk himself up. He's very forthright. And he says, you know, well, I ain't nothing to scream about. But that big bastard there, and he's not being mean when he says, says this. He's being complimentary. He can put up more grain alone than most pears can. And Lenny, who had been following the conversation back and forth between his eyes, smiled complacently at the compliment. Complacently. That word. Let's see if we get the definition. Pleased with oneself or situation. Okay, he's pleased with the compliment. Maybe he's heard that compliment before. Okay, and Slim looked approvingly at George for having given the compliment. It's kind of an odd thing to say, but I don't know, maybe it's just nice to talk about some people. All right, so George says, yeah, we kind of look after each other. Kind of? Well, not. why this word kind of? Why not just say they do look out for each other? Hmm. And again, we get, you know, the repetition here. He's not bright. Lenny's dumb, but he's hell of a good worker, and he's a nice fella, but he ain't bright. Repetition. I've knew him for a long time. Well, maybe that's also there's motivation for... Um, for George to stay with Lenny. He's just known him a long time. He's always been there. Okay. Now Slim makes up, you know, talks about like how that not a lot of guys travel together. We know this from the time period. And he says, I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. What could they be scared of? Really? Like companionship? Why is that scary? All right. Now we get another guy coming in. And he does, George does, oh, sorry, George does say it's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know. There's more motivation for him to stay with Lenny. You know, it's just nice having somebody to talk to. 
All right, we get now the entrance of some other characters. We have a big, powerful stomached man came into the bunkhouse. This is Carlson, one of the workers. Okay, he introduces himself, and we get, you know, the last names of George and Lenny again. Okay, and we get a joke from Carlson, you know, ha, 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 glad to meet you. He ain't very small. Well, yeah, verbal irony right there. Lenny isn't small, so... All right, now, Carlson's question here. Hey, Slim, meant to ask you, how's your bitch? I seen she wasn't under your wagon this morning. Um, he's actually referring to the original definition of the word, which is um, a female dog. It is, you know, not necessarily used in a derogatory sense here. It's used in the real sense. And Slim says... She slang her pups last night. She had babies, nine of them. Now, before you freak out the next line, because I'm sure you freaked out when you read it, that he says he had to drown four of them right off. She couldn't feed that many. Okay, now, remember life on the ranch. This is the Great Depression. There's not a lot of luxury. It's all utilitarian. You know, use what you can, when you can, when you have it. And if something doesn't serve a purpose, you have to get rid of it or move on. Okay? He would lose the female dog, the mother dog, if he kept all of them. So he have to make a sacrifice for the greater good. Drown some of the puppies so that the rest of them can live. Because if the mother dies, then they got nine pups that have no moms. Just keep that in mind, okay? But gee, remember what George tempted Lenny with in the beginning, in the clearing? <laughs> well, oh, and there's, by the way, there is the name of Slim's dogs. The name of Slim's dog is Lulu. Lulu, any remarkable or outstanding person or thing? Hmm, didn't know that. A female given name for Louise. Hmm, all right, well. Now, Carlson talks about Candy's dog. Candy, the old swamper. Finally, somebody says his name, and it's Carlson who says it first. I've been thinking that dog of Candy's so goddamn old he can't hardly walk. Stinks like hell, too. Every time he comes in the bunkhouse, I can smell him for two, three days. Why don't you get, oh, I'm sure you freaked out when you read this one. Why don't you get Candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up? Okay, now... Part of it is selfishness. You know, Carlson obviously doesn't like the smell of the dog, doesn't want to deal with it, you know. But he also says, too, like, the dog's got no teeth. He's damn near blind. He can't eat. Candy feeds him milk. He can't chew anything else. So, really, for this dog, what's the purpose for this dog on the ranch? The dog doesn't serve a purpose at this moment. And this isn't to be mean to put down the dog, but it's about, you know, put it out of its misery. Okay, and he still isn't being mean because he's like, well, give him one of the pups to raise up. That'll make Candy feel better. Hmm. But we all know we just can't let our old dogs go. All right, so then we get the triangle. The ringing of the triangle has to do with dinner bell. It's the dinner bell ringing, and all the guys go on out. Okay, Carlson and everybody walk out. Slim goes first. Slim stood up slowly and with dignity. Carlson stepped back to let Slim precede him, and then the two of them went out the door. Remember about entrances in order of power? Here we have exits also in order of power. And now, before George and Lenny joined the group for dinner, Lenny's all excited because he, what does he want? What does he want? A brown and white one? A brown and white puppy? So George, you know, says, all right, well, I'll ask him. And, um... You know, we'll take a look and see if we can get the pup. But before they leave, we get, we're all happy because Lenny's going to get a puppy, probably. But then look who bounces back in. Curly does. And he's angry, looking for the girl. Says he saw her about a half hour ago. Maybe it was a half hour. We don't know. And he says, you know, she was looking for him. But again, here we have foreshadowing. And this time, Curly doesn't look at George. He looks at, I'm sorry, he looks at George this time, not Lenny, and he sizes up Lenny. And then bounces out. But Steinbeck is keeping reminding you that Curly's going to cause trouble. And again, the reminder, uh-oh, I don't want to tangle with him myself. I hate his guts. There's going to be problems. 
And then we have the conclusion of the scene here with they went out the door and we have 